In this lesson, we'll take a look at a third reason why we do system consolidation, and that has to do with integrating information into semantic memory. And we'll also examine what semantic memory is as well and compare that to episodic memory. First, to recap, two other reasons why we might do system consolidation. You'll recall system consolidation is when we move memories from the hippocampal system out to the cortex for long-term storage. And the first reason had to do with interference uh, by new learning. So here we have an animal. We've induced LTP at uh, some hippocampal synapses. We stimulate high-frequency action potentials enough to drive the target cell so the conditions are met. LTP will occur at that synapse. And here it's represented by the larger terminal there, but it could be more receptors on the target cell, etc. Um, but then, right after inducing LTP, we allow the animal to learn something new. Ex it explores a new environment, for example. If then we go ahead and assess the strength of that synapse again, we find a reduced magnitude of synaptic uh, communication there, so reduced LTP. It's And compared to animals that don't have a, a learning um, episode here, uh, the ones that do have a learning episode have uh, reduced LTP. So it's as if the learning experience, the new learning experience, has interfered with the previously established LTP. Now, interestingly, that only occurs within a certain time window, and that time window is the time window of LTP. LTP has an early phase and a late phase. The late phase takes about six hours to be established, and we'll call that molecular consolidation, and that requires protein synthesis. Proteins have to be made by the cells so and then sent out to the synapses that were recently active to strengthen those connections. Well, that takes around six hours. If the new learning happens within that time frame, it can interfere with this late phase of LTP, and that's why we see a reduced LTP um, as a result of the interference. If the new learning happens after six hours, then you've given those synapses time to do molecular consolidation. The, the synapses get stronger in a way that they are less vulnerable to new learning. So the first reason was interference by new learning. So you want to move the memories out to the cortex. There are more synapses out here, so they're less vulnerable to interference. The second reason to do system consolidation has to do with another type of interference, and that's neurogenesis. In the hippocampus itself, new neurons are constantly being born, and they uh, mature and they integrate themselves into the hippocampal circuitry. But when they do so, they are interfering with previously established synaptic changes in the hippocampal circuitry, right? So they're going to be sort of wiping clean older memories that were made here in the hippocampus. And so uh, the rate of neurogenesis then uh, sets up a, a time constraint. You, you better consolidate memories that were in the hippocampus before um, more new neurons get in here and uh, mess up the circuitry. Right. So in a sense, forgetting happens when neurogenesis outpaces consolidation. If you can consolidate a memory before new neurons can get in there and mess with that uh, memory trace, uh, then you'll be able to remember it. But if the, if the new neurons or new learning are interfering with these uh, hippocampal memories, uh, then you may not successfully consolidate the memories out into the cortex. So the two uh, prior reasons for system consolidation had to do with interference in the hippocampus. The third, then, has to do with this idea of semantic memory. And to understand what semantic memory is, let's take a look at this situation here. All right. So now let's see the third reason why we might do system consolidation. That has to do with integrating new information into semantic memory. First, consider the uh, scenario here. Let's just say you go to the zoo and you meet the tiger for the first time. So that's going to be an experience. Your sensory areas, your, your visual areas and auditory areas and touch areas are going to be sending information that converges down in the hippocampus. LTP will be happening at the relevant synapses down here. And then over time, you'll be consolidating that experience. Now, we've been learning about episodic memory. If you consolidate that event, then you'll be able to retrieve that event and remember going to the zoo at some later point in time, right? And we're calling that system consolidation. And the kind of memory that's getting consolidated was an episode, an event memory, an episodic memory. But there's other kinds of information that gets stored there, not just your experience of the event. You also are going to be storing information about the world, for example, the tiger. 
And so we call facts about the world and the meanings of words, that kind of thing, the concepts that we understand, we're going to call that semantic memory. Now scientists think it sort of works like this. When the hippocampal system consolidates, not only do you consolidate it in memory of the zoo event, that's your episodic memory, your brain is also going to be storing information uh, that you experienced about the world, in this case the tiger. And the way it does so is shown in this diagram. So when you saw the tiger, your visual areas were perceiving the tig tiger. The visual areas were actively engaged in your perception of the tiger. But during system consolidation, the hippocampal system is going to store the image of the tiger in some of the same areas that are used to visually process the tiger. Likewise, the feel of the tiger will be stored in touch cortex, and the sound of the tiger is stored in the uh, auditory association cortex. And furthermore, during system consolidation, these distributed representations will be linked together, right, so that the sight of a tiger can activate what the tiger sounds like in your memory, or the feel of the tiger can, can retrieve what the tiger looks like. Now, not only did you see the tiger, hear the tiger, and feel the tiger, you also heard a word. So you were maybe with your parents, and your parents pointed out the animal, and they said tiger, right? They were pointing to it. Well, what is a word? It's a sound that refers to some object in the world, right? So the sound of the word tiger also gets linked into this distributed network. So to understand the concept of the tiger, it means that we can pick a tiger out from other animals by seeing it or hearing it. We understand the, the word tiger and what it means. It refers to this animal. And we might also have stored other information about the tiger, what it eats, where it lives, etc. So this is going to be our, our sort of understanding of what semantic memory entails. A distributed representation of tiger, including the word tiger, all linked together by LTP-like mechanisms up in the cortex. And this gets established during system consolidation. Now let's just consider one more aspect of, of concepts. And this kind of diagram like this is something a psychologist might uh, put together. And it's intended to represent how concepts are linked together. Right? So for example, the concept bird here is linked to the concept robin, because a robin is an example of a bird. right? Now, a robin has various characteristics. And so the, the, you know, the red breast and the blue eggs, etc. And canary has various characteristics. It sings, it's yellow. And birds have various attributes. They have feathers, and they fly. And so you can see in a diagram like this, concepts uh, have relationships. Uh, a robin is a bird. A bird is an animal. And now, not only that, concepts also have a hierarchical relationship. We would say the bird is a higher level category than the robin. The robin is an individual example of a bird. Animals a higher level category than bird. A bird is an example of an animal. There are many other kinds of animals besides birds. So here we see sort of a, a conceptual map uh, of how concepts are related. And scientists think that in the brain that's also what's going on. It's it's just that uh, these links here, these lines here, would be neural connections, axons and, and terminals on dendrites and synapses and so on. So the concept of a robin is linked in neural networks to the concept of a bird. Right? And the concept of a bird is linked to the concept of animal. Now, we were just talking about the idea of uh, going to the zoo and learning about tigers, right? So we have the concept of tiger, in a sense, uh, diagrammed here. Well, that tiger concept may be linked to other animal concepts as well, right? Uh, and so we're going to, as we experience life, we're going to be installing all kinds of world knowledge in a kind of conceptual map, as indicated here. And now comes the, the, the point about the, the value of system consolidation. Okay, so to see how system consolidation might help to integrate information, let's go back to the zoo. So here we have the tiger experience, and we consolidate not only the event memory, the episodic memory, but we consolidate semantic information about the tiger. But then we go on to the next part of the zoo. We see the cheetah, right? We're going to do the same thing. The event memory will be sort of bound together in the hippocampus LTP, and then we're going to consolidate not only the episodic memory, but the information about the cheetah. And so our brains are going to be consolidating uh, over these two episodes um, information about these two animals. Now down here we can see what scientists think is going on when uh, the, the hippocampal system consolidates up into the cortex. Let's let the 
uh, red dots be those neural elements, you know, neurons or populations of neurons that are part of the representation of the tiger, right? So up there in the cortex, the red ones would be some of those neural populations that are where um, uh, synapses will be changing, molecular consolidation happening to store information about tiger, maybe the visual image of a tiger. The blue ones will be uh, the neural ele elements involved in storing the cheetah information, maybe the visual image of a cheetah. Notice there's overlap, right? And so the idea is up in the cortex during system consolidation that the, the system consolidation enhances the common elements at the expense of the outliers. And so this will allow the formation of semantic categories. So the common neural elements in both representations becomes a way to represent the things that tigers and cheetahs have in common. And what do they have in common? Well, they have various features in common. They have four legs, they're carnivores, they run around and get their food, etc. And the idea is that those overlapping neural elements can be the basis of larger categories, for example, big cats, right? And so the concept of big cat would include, right, the tigers and the cheetahs and the leopards, etc. But again, then, system consolidation, then, if, it, if it's able to sort of identify those common elements of two different animals here, that gives us the basis for starting to build higher-level categories. And so the higher-level categories in this example, instead of robin and canary, it would be, right, it would be a tiger and cheetah, and the overlapping neural elements would be the basis of the next higher level category in big cats instead of bird here. Okay, finally then we can we can compare and contrast uh, the the concepts of episodic memory and semantic memory and we'll use a diagram like this. Notice there are two words up here to remember something and to know something. First let's let's see what we mean by remembering something. And notice there are two boxes here semantic the box that indicates semantic memory and then the episodic uh, box down here, this is the hippocampal episodic sort of memory system. Um, so in a diagram like this, here's the idea that we might uh, have uh, individual memories of meeting a certain person, right? And then as we interact with that person, we're going to learn different things about that person. So for example, um, we might learn because we've hung out with a person that they like, uh, they like to paint, they like barbecues, uh, they love somebody, and they like to golf, etc. Well, we can retain not only the memories of our interactions of that person, but through the consolidation process, we're also going to be storing up in semantic memory just facts about that particular person, right? So we can have two kinds of memory about that person. We can have actual uh, recollections, uh, episodic memories, all the times that we went to the barbecue with that person and painted with them and went golfing. But then we can also have stored in our semantic memory just facts about the person. And we, we say that we can remember something if we have access to those episodic rem uh, events, uh, episodic memories. In contrast, when we say we know something about a person, here's a person up in our semantic memory, and here we know that they like barbecues, they cycle, they swim, they love somebody. But notice the episodic box is empty. So in this diagram, what we mean by we know uh, things about a person is that we have semantic information stored in our cortex, but we do not have any episodic memories. In other words, we don't remember the time that we went swimming with this person, and so we learned that the person likes swimming. We don't remember the time that we went to the barbecue, and so we know that this person likes, bar uh, likes uh, barbecues. So in this diagram, then, the, the, the empty box here represents the, uh, the common state of affairs where we do not remember the learning episode, but what we do retain is the information, and we call that semantic memory. And this is very common. We learn a whole lot of th things about the world that we store in semantic memory, but we lose the episodic memories of those learning events. System consolidation has stored lots of information in our semantic memory, but we evidently uh, lose access or never consolidate uh, the episodes um, for which we, we learned different things about the world. 
Now, interestingly, these people with superior autobiographical memory, they are precisely the people that retain those episodes, right, in their memories. So they do consolidate the day-to-day -day events in their lives in ways that we don't. They have semantic memory just like we do, but unlike us, they retain the episodic memories of the sort of experiences that lead to semantic memories um, during system consolidation. And, and what is different in the brains of these people with superior episodic memory? One of the differences was that their temporal lobe was larger. And remember, we said the temporal lobe was an area where we might be storing memories, right? And so if you have a larger temporal lobe, you have greater storage space, and you may be able to consolidate all of those individual uh, events uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in a way that uh, those of us with smaller temporal lobes cannot. So again, remember the, the cortex has uh, lots of uh, synapse space, and if you have more temporal lobe, you have more uh, synapses to store distinct memories. Of course, there was another area of the brain that was also uh, larger, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that for another day.